Awesome. Hey, before you guys take a seat, could you help me welcome everyone joining us online right now as well? We're so glad you guys are here. And now give somebody a high five and grab a quick chair. Man, I'm so excited to uh, continue this series called Make Ready. We're in week two where we are doing our best to allow God uh, the ability to move in our life. And that means maybe, you know, getting rid of some things. It means doing some, some heart surgery, some hard work in our hearts so that uh, we can live the life that God has called us to live. And so when I, I was thinking about it today, uh, I was thinking about how a lot of us have, have toxins that get into our life and that we need to detox from some things. Now, whenever we think of detoxing, uh, we think of it in maybe two different ways. One is like detoxing from a chemical, you know, substance abuse or from, you know, drugs, alcohol, something like that. You can go to detox, you know, as kind of a, a kickoff to some rehab. Uh, but we think of it too, especially this time of year, as, as detoxing some things out of our systems, like cleansing some things, maybe like doing a juice cleanse or, you know, something to r remove our system of some toxins so that our bodies can can work well, so that we can feel better. And it happens around this time of year because we're like, hey, new year, new you, right? Let's go. Like we're, we're getting ready, you know, eat right, live right, garbage in, garbage out kind of, of thing. And we're all trying to prepare for, uh, you know, what God has for us this year, but also the summer. That's why we detox some things in our body because, you know, when the sun comes out, the guns come out. Come on, somebody, right? Then we get ready for that. We're ready to go someplace warm. We're ready, you know, for the sunshine and all those things. But we know that right now in winter, we can hide some stuff with some baggy sweaters. We can pop a few more Krispy Kremes. You know, we can do some of those things now, but we want to be healthy. And so sometimes we'll do what's called a cleanse. And I've never done one. I've had some friends that have done some juice cleansing before. Has anybody done a juice cleanse? You know, you like every meal is a juice. Every meal you, you get one of those bullets or a blender and you put in a little bit of, you know, a little spinach, a little pinch of kale, and then a pint of Chunky Monkey and you blend it all up. <laughs> and you call it healthy, you call it a smoothie. You're like, oh, I just feel so fit, you know, right now. Drinking this, uh, I haven't done that, but I have tried to cleanse caffeine before. I've tried to kick caffeine to the curb. In fact, I tried it at the beginning of this year. Um, you know, because I have been known to drink a Mountain Dew, Diet Mountain Dew or two, two packs a day, generally, six packs. Um, and I just decided, man, it can't be good for me. I'm going to get rid of some caffeine in my life. And so for, you know, beginning of the year, I mean, I was like three days into it, just crushing headaches. I mean, it was, it was terrible. Like the light hurt my eyes. I'd get in my, my office. I'd turn out the lights. I'd curl up in a ball, suck my thumb, you know, just kind of like... My eyes are twitching, you know, and like I'm, I'm irritable, I'm mad, nobody likes being around me. And so because I love you, church, I am once again drinking Diet Mountain Dew <laughs> because nobody needs that. Nobody needs an angry preacher preaching at them. My, my family doesn't need that, the staff doesn't need that. Um, but I was having all kinds of withdrawals because it's hard. How many of you know getting rid of some, some toxins in our life is hard? It's challenging, but how many of you also know that it's only through hard work? It's like at the end of, of a hard road do we find some blessings. The end of some hard knocks, is, it's like growing muscle in our life. You know, in order for it to grow, it has to be torn. There has to be some, some stretching. And so that's kind of what it's like to remove some toxins in our life. And in fact, here's what detox means. It means removal of toxic substance from a living organism. From a living organism. And so today I want to talk about removing some, some, some toxic substances from our heart. Now, not necessarily our physical heart, but I want to talk about our spiritual heart. How many of you know you, have, you are a spiritual being? Like you have your, your body, your physical part, but you're also a spiritual being. And it's the part of us that, that God says, you know, comes alive in Christ, that our spirit is a, a live. And because of that, uh, I want us to think in, this, in terms of detoxing from a broader perspective, like there are some toxins that we're trying to eliminate from our, our spirit. Because when toxins are present in our life, like they're, when they're present in our physical body, our bodies do not operate at the, the optimal, you know, level. 
you know, like an athlete. That's why athletes, you know, are very meticulous about what they put into their body because they know that any kind of toxins will keep them from operating at the level of their full potential. And so I would submit to us today that many of us are not operating at the level of our full potential. I'd say most of us, including myself, spiritually speaking, we are not operating at the level that God has for us. And when, when Jesus said what's available to us in John 10:10 10, 10, is that he came to give us life and give us life to the full, to give us life more abundantly, for us to live this life that is fully alive. So how do we do that when we have these toxins in our system? I'm suggesting today that we all need a cleanse. Not a juice cleanse, but maybe a heart cleanse. Maybe a, a spiritual detox, all of us, no matter how long you've known God for, by the way. It doesn't matter if you're new to the journey, new to the faith, it doesn't matter you know, where you, you are on your, your journey, but we all need to detox some things uh, in our life. However, we don't just need to cleanse them, we also need to replenish them. And so I wanna talk about that today. The things that we have to cleanse, but also what we can do to, to fill that vacuum once we've removed some of those toxins from our, our heart. So I'm gonna give you four things today, maybe five. We're gonna see how this goes. Um, toxins that creep in to our heart. And this is gonna be more uh, of a teaching time. So I'd encourage you to do this. Grab, grab that pen in front of you or, or just pull the one out of your purse that you stole from church. Just pull that out, whatever it is. Which is fine, by the way. We, we, we don't mind at all. One of these days we're gonna have a prodigal pen Sunday and everybody's just, all the prodigal pens are gonna come, come home. No, keep those, give them out, toss them everywhere you can, you know, that's fine. Uh, get out your phone, whatever, take some notes. Because here's what I know, and if you've lived any amount of life, you might say, well, Colby, I'm pretty good right now. Well, that's great. But there's gonna be a season in your life that you're gonna need this, that you're gonna wanna refer back to this. You're gonna be like, where is that thought? Where did I write that down? Or, you know, what is that scripture? reference because you will need this. And let me give you a, a heads up about this message. You know how some messages are, are encouraging? Some messages are like, man, that's good, pastor. Preach that. Let me hear more of that. Amen. <laughs> this is going to be less of an amen and more of an ouch. Because we need this. We do. Like if you want to stay exactly the same, stay where you are, then, then that's fine. But sometimes we need a little bit of an ouch in order to propel us to what God has for us. And so I want to start with this. Paul said in 2 Corinthians 7, 1, he says, Therefore, since we have these promises, dear friends, let us, say these next two words with me, let us purify ourselves, ourselves from everything that does what contaminates body and spirit that contaminates, that, that are toxins in our, in our heart and in our, our soul, perfecting holiness out of reverence for God. Here's what I want you to notice as we begin to talk about detoxing. Um, this right here is up to you. What did he say? Purify ourselves. You are the one that's gonna make this happen. Now this is not, of course, uh, has anything to do with heaven. That's not you, that's not me, that's all Jesus and what Jesus has done through his sacrifice on the cross for us. But the way you and I live our life today, how closely we walk with God, the, the, the potential for us to have the full life that Jesus promised us depends on, on this. Let us purify ourselves. The way that your heart and my heart is ready to be a platform for God to use, Paul said, let us purify ourselves. He didn't say, let God purify us. He said, he said, let us. So that goes without saying, we have some personal responsibility in this. Are you with me? Which means you're not gonna wake up tomorrow and go, all right, God, do it. Won't he do it? He's a good God, he's going to do it. No, it means you're gonna wake up tomorrow and you gotta get to work. You gotta get to work, you have a part to play, I have a part to play. It means you have to walk out of this room and you gotta get to work. Let us purify ourselves of the things that contaminate us, the toxins. So Paul's saying, hey, you need a detox. You need a heart detox. Well, Colby, how do I know if I have contaminants in my life? How do I know if I need a, a detox? That's a good question. I think one of the ways we, we realize it 
is when we get to the place that Paul talked about in Romans 7, where he said, hey, I don't know why it is, but there are some things that, that I don't want to do, but I keep on doing them. There's this battle that's going on. And the things that, that I, you know, I want to do, I can't even make myself do. In fact, he says this. He says, man, I'm just such a messed up person. Anybody feel that way sometimes? Uh, he says, I'm a wretch. Who will save me from this body of death is what he says. And what Paul is describing is something that you and I all experience. It's this battle that we have with our flesh, our sin nature. The Bible calls it our, our flesh. And it's the part of us that uh, um, wants to punch the person in the face that cuts us off on the road. You know what I'm talking about? That's our flesh that does that. It's the part of us that does not want to forgive the person who offended us. How dare, you know, I'll never forgive them for what they've done. It's the part of us that, that does not want to love the people who treat us poorly. But you need to know if you've placed your faith in Jesus, God tells us that through his word, our spirit comes alive. There's no longer us who lives. It's Christ who lives in us. And we've been made alive in, in Christ. And so the spirit of God on the inside of us is the part that's going, you know, maybe you shouldn't punch him in the face. Instead, maybe you should pray for him. Or instead, maybe you should turn the other cheek and, and let them hit you again. Instead, maybe you should try loving them, which is one of the, the reasons, by the way, we honor and love uh, Dr. Martin Luther King this weekend. Like for what he stood for, for the way he turned the other cheek, for the way he, you know, would, would bring these nonviolent protests, you know, against, you know, against, you know segregation and would stood for civil rights. And, and he did it because he was such a great man of faith. Great man of God, I would encourage you to listen to maybe a Dr. Martin Luther King message today or sometime this week. In fact, something very cool uh, about that is that this church, you guys need to know this, that last night at the, the Martin Luther King Awards banquet, this church was given like the highest level of award for the way that you serve in our community and represent a lot of what Dr. Martin Luther King stood for. So thank you so much. That's huge, you guys. That's unbelievable that we get to be a part of that. This is what Paul is saying. We, we have this battle inside of us, this wrestling, this, this back and forth, this push and pull, this war, this toxin that builds up in our life. And I don't, the things that I want to do, I don't do. The things that I, I, I don't want to do, I do. And so then he says this in Romans 8, it will be up on the screen. How do we handle this? He says, those who live according to the, the flesh... Right, that fleshly part of us, that sinful nature, have their minds set on what the nature does. That's what our, we're focused on. But those who live in accordance with the Spirit have their minds set on what the Spirit desires. And what it says in verse 6, the mind governed by the flesh or, or the governed by the, the mind of a sinful man is death. Is death. Well, Colby, that's pretty strong. Like, like really, is, is death? It is strong. But you and I, we intuitively know this because unforgiveness that goes unaddressed builds up in your heart. You know what that leads to? Bitterness. And do you know what bitterness ultimately leads to? A type of death. Not for forgiving a loved one or having friction in a relationship that goes unaddressed, that goes unworked out, can lead to a type of death in that relationship, can it not? When you start rubbing, uh, you know, and withholding love from one another. So he's, we, we, we understand this. He said the mind of the sinful man is death, but the mind that is governed by or controlled by the spirit is life and peace. Life and peace. So what do we have to do? We have to detox some things in our hearts, in, in our spirits, right? That we have to cleanse some things out and also replenish them so that you and I are more controlled by the spirit instead of being controlled by the flesh. So we don't just need clean eating this year. We need clean hearts beating in sync with God's heart so that you and I don't miss a single thing that he has for us in this coming year so that you and I make our hearts ready to be a platform for him to use. And that leads, he says, ultimately to life and peace. And I don't know about you, but I'd like some more life and peace. Anybody else want some more peace this year? Come on, let's get some more peace. So I'm gonna give you four things. I want you to write these down. Again, these will be challenging, um, but, you know, our muscles won't grow unless they're, they're stretched. And so this detox that I, I want to talk about, I'm going to ask you guys 
to do these things for one week. One week. Again, if you don't take action on this, like we're just wasting time. But let's do these four for one week. I'm not saying do it all year long. Colby, we just got off a week of, you know, prayer of fasting. That's great. Let's continue this on. Now, I don't think there's a better time than to con- keep going, you know, running after and chasing after, after what God has for your life. So do these for one week, not a month, not the entire year, but for one week. Um, and that, that's it. And I think by Wednesday, you might be, you know, curled up in a ball, sucking your thumb, you know, in the corner. But by Friday, I believe you're, you're, you're going to feel alive in your spirit. I feel you're going you're gonna to be in more connected to God than you have been. And I think that you're going to want to continue to live this way. I really do. So here's the first one. Number one we got to cleanse is independence. Independence. Now, that seems odd. Colby, because independence, is that not a, a good thing? And I would say yes to a, a certain degree. Independence is okay, but to a great degree, it is highly detrimental. And I know our world pushes this. Our world teaches us you need to be independent. You need to be your own person. You are a self-made man. You are a self-made woman, right? You can do your own thing. But what it really teaches us is to isolate ourselves, from anyone and everyone, to isolate ourselves from healthy relationships. Well, I don't need you. You don't need me. I don't don't need you to to help me with this. I'm good on my own. And I personally have to guard against this toxin in my life because my my natural bent is not to just go, you know, hang out with people and sing kumbaya around a fire. That's not how I'm wired. My natural bent is not to, you know, go out and let's get coffee and share deep darks with each other. Like, I don't want to do that. And that terrifies me. But I know that in the kingdom of God, you know, my life is desperate for and needs relationships. And it will be, you know, direct result of godly relationships that get me to where God wants me to go. You know, so we need this. We need this. Why? Because there are days that, that you're going to be strong and I'm weak and I need your strength. There's going to be days that, that I'm strong and you're weak and you're going to need my strength to come alongside of you. There are going to be roads that, that I've gone down that you have not yet gone down. And I'm going to want to walk with you and point out some landmines along the way. And there's going to be some roads that you've walked down that I need to come alongside of you and have you and your experience lead me. Are you with me? So I need to cleanse my heart of this sense of, of independence, this independent mentality. I can do it myself. I don't need anybody. I got, I got this. No, I need relationships. I need godly relationships. Now, quickly, that does not mean we swing the pendulum to the opposite end, to where we're in an unhealthy dependency upon someone else. Like nobody wants that. Nobody wants to be solely dependent upon someone else. That's called codependency, and that's not healthy either. That's not a healthy heart. That's not God's design. It's somewhere in the middle. So it's not independence and it's not dependence. Here's what it is. You can write it down if you want. It's interdependent. Interdependence. You know what that means? It means I don't need you to, to give me my value or my worth. Like I, I don't need you to give me my, my calling. You did not give me my calling. You did not give me my confidence. That comes from from God and and who he is in my my life. I don't need you for that. I'm not needing anything from you, but I am giving something into this relationship. And you are giving something back in this this relationship. It is this interdependence with one another, which is why, by the way, we're constantly pushing uh, small groups, get in a group, get in a group, get around some people. Why, Colby? Because you cannot do life alone. Like you can't do it. You need, you know, three, four, five people in your, your life studying together, reading God's word together, praying for one another. It's the way big church becomes small. Like we, we are desperate for this. This is how God works. And in fact, I'll just, I'll say this. If you are not in a group and you want to be, email me directly. Colby at elevatechurch.com. And I will make sure we bring some people to, to come around you and to, to partner with you in this. Because we need true relationships, not fake ones. Not like the guy at work that you don't, you know, you don't really even know his last name that sits in the cubicle, you know, next to you. And you're kind of iffy on his first name, right? Because you're always addressing him as, hey, man, man, right? You know how we do, man, that's my friend. 
Well, Colby, I got friends. You don't have, you, they're not, you don't even know if they're married. You don't know if they have a family. You don't know anything about them. I'm not talking about the people that you get in line with at Starbucks you see every morning and you give the little, what's up, nod to, right? That's not your friends. I'm talking about people that you can go to and say, hey, man, I don't know how to tell you this, but I'm struggling. I need you to pray for me. I need you to come alongside me. And it's a safe place. It's a safe person. It's a safe environment. Like this is, this is how, how God works through people in our life. Ecclesiastes 4.12 says this, though one may be overpowered, two can defend themselves. That's good. Like we need that. But he says a cord of three, three strands is not quickly broken. You need to know this because you have an enemy of your soul, whether you want to identify him or believe it or not, that wants to take you out. He wants to steal, kill, and destroy from your life. And do you know who he targets? The one who's by themselves. The one who's isolated. The one who is away from from the pack. And it says, man, two of you together, at least you got a fighting chance against the enemy. But three, three of you, you're going to stomp that enemy's head. You know, come on, three is better. So get some people in your, your life, three. And what's interesting, uh, the Bible teaches us, although the literal word is not in the text, but it teaches us of a triune God. You know what that means? God, the, the Father, God, the Son, God, the Holy Spirit teaches us of that. It teaches us that, that even community at the highest level, the Godhead level is necessary. So you're telling me you got something better going on than God? You're telling me you don't need this? I sure would love to know what it is that you've got going on. So cleanse ourselves of independence. Number two, write this down, self-centeredness. I told you. I told you it's going to be tough because nobody's going, yay, self-centeredness. Let's talk more about that. And I, I don't think this happens intentionally. I just think over time, little drops of, of self-centeredness Little toxins start to get deep down into our, our spirit. And we would never say that about us because we are repelled by people who we call are self-centered, right? We, we just don't like that. We're like, they're self-centered. But I think all of us to a degree are self-centered, focused on our, our self. Even in little ways, it could come out and somebody in, says, hey, man, could you help me out, you know, with this thing this weekend? And you're like, uh, the eye roll. You know, what is it you need, you know, kind of thing. And you go reluctantly. Why? Because it's not about them, it's about you. It's what can I get out of it? What, is, what am I going to get, you know, from, from this? It's not about, about others, it's all about, about you. Like, Mom, you know what, you know, Mom asks you to put away your laundry. This is what happens in our house. Put away your laundry. Ugh. What am I going to get out? How much are you going to pay me to put away my laundry? Are you kidding me right now? She washed and folded your clothes. Like, we're going to pay you by letting you keep those clothes. You better go put those away. <laughs> like, it's just this self-centeredness that creeps into our life. And again, it can come in, in small ways. This idea that, man, I'm really the center of my universe, but I hate to burst your bubble. You're not. Jesus is the center of everything. Everything revolves around him. So how would it change your life if you decided this week just to detox from a little bit of self-centeredness, like practically speaking. What would that look like if you, if you knew that there were two or three things that you could do for your spouse early in the morning that would set them up for success, that would make their morning run a little bit more smooth than it has? And check this out, do it without being asked to do it. That'll help. Like what would it look like if you helped somebody in the office that, that you knew was swamped this week that had a report, they had a deadline, you know, and it wasn't your area of responsibility, but you took something off of their, their plate. It's just getting your eyes off of you and getting them onto someone else and seeing how you can help because it's not about you. What if you just saw a need and you met the need without being asked? Not about what's in it for me, what can I get out of it? You know, who's gonna get the credit for it? Like none of that. It's what can I do for someone else because I don't want to live a self-centered life. Are you with me? We have to get rid of the, the self-centered toxin. And it's in there because this is the message that our world is pushing, is it not? Everything, every song, 
It's all about you and your desires and your needs. Everything media and marketing, you know, is telling us it's about, you know, what, what it is that makes you happy and your, your joy. I'm just telling you that's completely contrary to the kingdom of God. It is not about us. It's about others. It's about others. And I know some of the pushback is, well, Colby, if I'm just focused on others, who's going to take care of me? How am I going to manage? How am I going to get by? And I understand that, but can I just remind you, God tells us that his eye is on the sparrow. His eye is on the sparrow. It tells us that he will clothe the, the lilies in random fields with more splendor than all of Solomon ever had. So do you not think that God can take care of you? Do you not think that God's going to be able to do everything and give us everything that we need? I think this is just how the kingdom of God works. You take care of others, and God takes care of you in return. So how would it change your life? Just this week, you tried to detox from a little bit of self-centeredness in your family, in your marriage, in your workplace, in your school. You know what I think? I think um, in a world that is so self-centered, it would look so radical to people that you would live this way. They would have no idea how to respond to you. They think you're sick. They think you lost your mind helping others out. Like detox from self-centeredness. Here's what God's word tells us in Philippians chapter two. It says, do nothing. Somebody say nothing. 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 Like I have, I have a hard time with this. Do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit, but in humility consider others better than your yourselves. You know what humility is? It's not thinking less of yourself. Humility is not going around saying, you know, woe is me. You know, I'm, I'm so awful. I, I'm terrible. You know, no one likes me. Everybody hates me. Guess I'll go eat worms. You remember that song? <laughs> That's not humility. Humility is not thinking less of your, yourself. Humility is thinking of yourself less is what I've heard. It's not thinking less of yourself. Because when we walk around thinking, you know what, you know, I'm just no good, I'm nothing. Can I remind you, you've been created in the image of God. And when you talk that way about yourself, you're actually insulting the person, the God who created you. That's not humility. He goes on to say humility. Each, each of you should look not only to your interests. Look at that. Not only. Not only. Paul's not saying don't ever consider what you need. But not only, don't only, don't make it all uh, about you. Don't make you all you care about, but also to the interests of others. I just think some of us, man, we just need a self-centered juice cleanse. And we need a little bit of spinach, a little bit of kale, some of God's word, blend it up, and let's go. Number three, you ready? Yeah, I don't think you're ready either. <laughs> Negativity. Negativity. Now, if when you saw this point, you thought, of course he would talk about that. This is for you. <laughs> you need this. Negativity. And again, I'm not saying this is an intentional thing. I think this can just kind of start to happen in our life through time. And it could be because some of past issues. It could have been because of some trauma or daddy or mama issues, you know, in your your life, but it's amazing to me how we can be standing in the middle of blessings and still find something to complain about. It's amazing to me how we can be in one of the wealthiest you know, countries in the world and be provided for, and it might not be to the extent that you want, but still have, some, it's, it's amazing to me how you can be driving in your car and complain about something in your car. Well, it doesn't have a heated steering wheel and it's cold in the winter. You're in a car. You're in a car. Did you forget you're, you're, you're in a car? Well, it doesn't have, yeah, but you're in a car. Like I've been places where, where people have had to walk three to four hours just to get to church and I'm 100% sure nobody walked to church today. Like I'm, you drove or you, you rode to church. Sometimes in the middle of blessings, we can just, we find something to be negative about. But PC, you know, the problem is, but the problem is, the problem is all you see is the problem in everything that you see. 
instead of seeing the possibility, instead of seeing the, the opportunity. And again, this is not something that you wake up tomorrow and can be different in your life and God's gonna make it different. It's Paul, Paul said that we have to purify ourselves. We have to, this is a choice of our will to see everything differently. This is all about perspective. And if you have a behavioral pattern that's just this negative bent towards everything all the time, we have to detox from that pattern and force ourselves to see things more positively. Now, I am not saying that you need to walk around with your head in the sand, like nothing's ever wrong, everything's always, you know, fine. I'm just saying you get to choose what you see, problem or possibility. And more importantly, you get to choose how you see it. You get to choose the attitude in which you approach that problem. You get to choose the attitude that, that you take in, in solving whatever that opportunity is, that even in the middle of difficulty, you say, God, I wanna see your goodness in this. I wanna see the blessing in this. And you might have to mine it out. That's why I'm saying this is work. It might have to get mined out. You might have to dig it out. It's gonna take some, some work to look for the good thing in the middle of the hard thing. But it's in there. And can I tell you something? The, the, the negative person, if that's you, and all you're bringing is problems and problems, when people see you coming, they hide. They duck, right? Because you have this uncanny ability to like suck the air out of a room, just like that. In fact, I know some people who are so skilled in the art of being negative, they can take a, a funeral down to a lower level. That's rough right there, you know what I'm saying? No, I'm saying, man, I wanna see the possibility. I wanna see the, the opportunity. How would it change your perspective if you woke up and said, man, I'm gonna, I'm gonna find the good in this day. I'm gonna see the good in this. In fact, I'm gonna speak good into this day. How many of you know there's power in your words? That's not self-help kind of preaching. That's God's word. He says there's power of life and death in our, our tongue. And so it could be that all you see is negative because all you say is negative. Uh-oh, right? There's power in that. So let your words reflect that about you, that you just wanna find the opportunity and the potential. And so this week, if you struggle with a negative kind of bent, here's what you practically can do. Tell somebody, say, man, I know I wrestle with this. Seems like this is my spirit. It seems like everything, you know, I just see, I see the problem and I don't want to be this way. I wanna see the good in things. I wanna be, you know, a, a positive kind of thing. Will you help me be accountable to that? Maybe some of you should even take a, a jar and put it on your kitchen counter. And anytime someone says negative, assign a dollar amount to it and put that dollar in that jar, whatever it is, right? Some of you are about to go broke this week and that's all right. It will help you. This will help you. And then at the end of the week, you need to bring that jar, bring it to church and tie it. No, I'm just kidding. Don't do that. <laughs> Go out. Do something fun with it. Right? Some of you are, are, are so negative that you need to make it not a dollar, at $10 every time you say something. Because how many of you know, if there is never a sting to that behavior, you will never change that behavior until you feel that there's, there's a sting involved. So some of you, man, you gotta, you're gonna have to sacrifice this. Who said, you know, until the, the pain of staying the same is greater than the pain of change, you'll never change. And so maybe it's not, you know, putting money in a jar, but maybe it's every time you say something neg negative and somebody calls you out, you have to say three positive things about your life, three things that God is doing in your life. But we have to do something different is my point. You cannot allow those toxins to stay in your heart and in your, your soul. It's keeping you from the full life that God has for you. So let's purify ourselves. Here's what scripture says about it, Ephesians 4, 29. Don't let any unwholesome talk come out of your mouth, but only what is helpful in building others up according to their needs. Not your needs, their needs. What's gonna help the people in my home? What's gonna help my, my staff? What's gonna help the, 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 my, my teachers? You know, what's gonna help you know, the people you know, in, in the office? How, how can I build them up that it may, check this out, benefit those who listen? So don't miss that. As you build others up, there might be people listening. 
And your words are like just these, these deposits that you're throwing around encouraging people that you don't even know you're encouraging. You could be standing in the line at Wegmans, checking out, say something you know, positive to your children or to your, your spouse, and that cashier hears it, and it brightens their day. It blesses them. Like it's so that other people, it benefits those who are, are listening. So let's just be, you know, positive. Let's get rid of that, that negativity. In fact, a, a not too far distant cousin from negativity, you know what it is? It's gossip. And it is easy to slip into. But it is a hundred times more deadly. A hundred times. In fact, here's a good definition of, of gossip. And that is when a negative is discussed with someone who cannot solve that problem then you're gossiping. That looks like, you know, standing around the water cooler in the office, you know, saying, hey, did you hear about so-and-so? I heard, you know, they left because they couldn't hack it or, or did you hear, you know, what corporate's making us do? They're making us collate our, you know, our year-end reports differently. And you might be right, but the very fact that you are gossiping about it, you're not talking to the person that can actually do something about it, you are tearing that down, something that someone built with blood, sweat, and tears, and sacrifice, and you are undermining the culture that's been created. Well, Colby, that's awfully, you know, strong, and I do agree with that, but, but, but people just come to me. People just come to me over and over. They just tell me things. Do you know why they come to you? Because you allow it. Because you have been a listening ear. And by not encouraging them to go straight to the top, to go to, you know what, like the Matthew principle says, hey, don't go to that person. Go to, go to the one who has actually offended you. But by not doing that, you are a party to it. And you are continually perpetuating that behavior, that sin pattern of gossip in their, their life. I don't know if I agree with that. That's strong. It is, but that's not my words. This is God's Word. Let me read some verses. Proverbs 16, 28. A troublemaker plants seeds of strife. Gossip separates the best of friends. Come on, tell me that hasn't happened in your life before. Tell me there, are, there aren't relationships in your life that have been fractured because of things that have been said about them and not to them. Proverbs 17, 4. Wrongdoers eagerly listen to gossip. Proverbs 25, 10, others accuse you of gossip and you will never regain a good reputation. It is really difficult once trust has been broken for somebody to think, yeah, you might be somebody that I could, I could you know, have confidence in. Proverbs 18, 8, rumors are like dainty morsels. They sink deep into one's heart. This is how some people feed on gossip. They're like, oh, it's so good, it's so good, it's so good. Tell me more, tell me more. Oh yeah, what else, what else? It's like this dainty morsel, Psalm 41, 6. They visit me as though they are my friends, but all the while they gather gossip to spread everywhere. Now people will come over and talk to you about something, and then as soon as they leave, they're talking about it somewhere else. And I, sometimes we disguise this and say, oh, I'm just so concerned. I'm just so concerned for them. Well, go to them. Don't talk about them. Go to them if you are that concerned. Right, go, go to that person. And can I just tell you, if somebody is willing to gossip to you, they are definitely willing to gossip about you. 100% every time. So shut it down. Shut it down. Sorry, that was a little rant. Here's the last one. I'm okay. I'm not angry. I have caffeine. I'm good. Sin. I know as soon as you see that, some of you are like, man, I heard this growing up my whole life, Colby. I'm a sinner. I'm just a sinner. I'm terrible. I'm going, I'm going to hell. God and Jesus, they, they're mad at me. It's a condemnation, condemnation. And I just want you to, to lean in closely to this because every time we talk about sin, I need to make sure you understand what it is. It is an archery term for all the bow hunters in the room. And it just means you, you've missed the mark. And so there are some patterns in our life where we are sinning, where we are continually missing the mark. And in order to, to hit the mark, we need to, what do you need to do in, in bow hunting or, you know, shooting a bow and arrow? You need to re-aim. You know what re-aiming is? It's repentance. It's saying, I know I'm going the wrong direction. I know I'm not hitting it here. So I need to re-aim my life in, in order to, to hit the mark. So when you are, have unforgiveness in your heart, you know, you just, you refuse to forgive, you refuse to forgive. 
you need to re-aim your life to forgiveness. And when you have, you know, you're an offense against someone, you just, you're holding on to that, you need to re-aim aim your, your life. That's what repentance is. It's re-aiming because we're aiming at the wrong thing. Why? Because it gratifies our flesh. Ultimately, that's what feeds us. It feels so good to hold that grudge, does it not? feels so, so good, but it doesn't lead to a, a full life. Like, I understand we want to get back at them, but it doesn't lead to this full, full life. So we need to re-aim. God says, I've called you to re-aim. I've called you to live, live at a higher level, to aim, aim high. Come on, where's my Air Force people? Aim high, right? Here's what the Bible says, Romans 6, 13. Don't offer the parts of your body to sin as instruments of wickedness, but rather offer them to God as those who have been brought from death to life. In other words, stop aiming at the, the wrong thing. Why? Because it's going to lead you down that road to death. Over and over, unforgiveness ultimately ends up in death, death of a, a relationship. It's leading you down a path that God's saying is not my best for you. And he says, offer the parts of your body to him instead as instruments of, of righteousness. Now, God, I'm going to trust that your way is the best way. That I'm going to trust as I get rid of these, these toxins in my life that your word talks about, right? That you're going you're to have me live that full life. But it's not just about removing things. It's also about replenishing. I have the band come help me shut this thing down. I want to give you three things quickly that we need to replenish back into our life. And one is, is the word of God. It's the word of God. Like as soon as you begin to remove some things, some toxins of self-centeredness and independence and negativity and all those things from your life, you need to fill that vacuum with something else. And I would suggest the word of God because it is life. It's life. It, it feeds us. It nourishes us. You know the word of God is called bread. It's the bread of life. How many of you in this room, if you went without eating, like, wouldn't your body start to break down? Like, well, how many of you, if you, just, if you just ate one time a week, I don't know what some of you are thinking, well, if I just ate one time a week, I'd already be in that size that I want to be in by June. But your body would start to break down. So why is it we think that we can come and get the word of God one time a week? It's the bread of life that sustains us, that nourishes us, that feeds us. Some of us, it's less than that, if I'm being honest. Once or twice a month. And we need the word of God. What would it look like if you took five minutes a day, just five minutes a day, and got into God's word? Colby, where would I start? Just download the YouVersion app. Get out your paper Bible. And this is an area, listen, listen, I, I talk about how things don't change overnight. This is something, it could change your life overnight because that five minutes that you spend in God's word is five minutes you're not spending being negative. It's five minutes you're not spending being self-centered. It's five minutes, right, that you're not spending, are you with me? It is an immediate return on that investment. If you would just get into to God's word, God's word. I don't know how much direction you're missing for the day because it's right there in his Word. Romans 12, 2, don't conform to the patterns of this world, but be, be transformed by the renewing of your mind. And the way I know to renew your, your mind is through reading God's word. Psalm 1, 1 says this, blessed is the man who does not walk in the counsel of wicked or stand in the way of sinners or sit in the seat of mockers, but his delight is in the law of the Lord, the word of God, and he meditates on it day and night. Here's what you need to replenish with, just saturating your mind with the word of God. And the second thing is this, is worship. And I know we can worship in a lot of different ways. I'm specifically talking about in song. So what if you gave five minutes in, in God's word, and you gave five minutes in just, in just worship for one week, that's all I'm saying, just a week, every day for just one week, I believe it will change your life. I know it will change your day. Like listen, Taylor Swift, she can wait a week, it's okay. Sean Mendez. Is that his name? <laughs> My boys listen, I don't know. He can wait a week. Uh, maybe by, you know, on Wednesday, you'll be tweaking in the corner. But by Friday, 
I believe the worship of God will just kind of be soaked into your soul and into your heart. Worship. And here's the last one. You probably can, can already guess what it is. It's prayer. It's prayer. It's talking to God. So five minutes in the word, five minutes in worship, and five minutes in prayer. Second Chronicles 14 says, if my people who are called by my name will humble themselves, pray, seek my face, and turn. Somebody say turn. Re-aim. Re-aim from your wicked ways. Detox from the contaminants in your heart and in your, your life. Turn. I will hear from heaven, forgive their sins, and heal. Tell me that's not a good promise. And he spells out exactly how it happens. Turn, seek my face, pray, I'll hear, and I will heal. And I believe some of you need some healing in your, your land, in the land of your marriage, in the land of your, your career, in the land of your finances. There needs to be healing happening in, in your land. I know that in prayer, prayer is the way that unlocks and unleashes the blessings of heaven into our, our lives. And I don't know about you, I don't wanna wait till I die one day to get all that God has for me in heaven. Prayer is the way we can do it now. And you know what else you, know, you should know about prayer? It's the way we push back the enemy from our life as well. Because what does God's word say? Jesus says, my house needs to be a house, not of good preaching, not of good music. It needs to be a house of what? Prayer. My house should be a house of prayer because everything else stems from that. So let's do that now. Would you stand to your feet? Bow your head, close your eyes. We're gonna worship through this. But I believe right now as we do this, God is speaking to some of your hearts about turning, re-aiming your life. Maybe you're not a follower of Jesus, but you know God has brought you to this moment right now to turn, to to confess, to seek his face, to, to say, I'm a sinner, I'm missing the mark. But the good news is, is God sent his son to be a savior for us to not be perfect, to always hit the mark, but to be a sacrifice for, for when we miss it. And some of us are still paying for our own sin because we have not allowed Jesus and his sacrifice to do it for us. But if you would humble yourself, seek his face, turn from your wicked ways. He'll hear you and he'll heal you. So Father, right now, in this moment, God, we confess that we are sinners. We confess that there are things in our heart that are keeping us from your best, from the, the full life that you have planned for each and every one of us. And so God, would you begin to do an amazing work a miraculous work for people who are far from you right now as they are confessing you are our Lord and Savior, that they're just drawn to you, God, knowing that they are desperate for a, a Savior. And Jesus, you made a way where there was no way for us to have a relationship with God in heaven. And so as we confess you as Lord, believe in our heart that you're raised from the dead, we'd be saved. So right now, if you're far from God and you wanna have that moment, I just invite you to take a moment to say, Jesus, I'm, I'm a sinner. I need you to save me. Make me new. Get rid of the, the oldness and the toxins in my life. Make me a new creation in Christ. Forgive me for my sin. I repent, I re-aim my life. I wanna follow after you. You're my Lord and Savior. So God, right now, let us not give up. Let us not grow weary in doing good. Let us not grow weary in this season of doing the hard work of, of plowing the, the hard ground of our hearts and removing things that are keeping us from your best. And so God, we pray as we really lean in and worship that your spirit would move, your spirit would come alive in us. God, you would fill us up with your word, fill us up with your presence, fill us up and worship as we pray and seek you in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's worship.